interested, but amen, God answered, and that was good, and we had some good friends who encouraged her to be so. Um, but there you go, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. When you see certain things, one person will see it one way, and another person, they're looking at it thinking, wow. You know, you look at that, um, the Kathmandu presentation there. You know, some people look at that and think, wow, what an amazing opportunity. What a great chance. What a brilliant thing. When I first heard of it, I thought, man, we miss Christmas. So what do we do with presents? <laughs> Literally. I mean, how messed up is that? But that was my first reaction. Because, you know, when you see stuff, it says a lot about your heart, doesn't it? And so, you know, we're going to talk about uh, this today. And I, I'm going to introduce you to a member of the Watkins household that I don't think many of you have ever met. This person... <laughs> This person is called Shambles. Shambles has been with Jane since she was six. We had a Bible discussion recently. It was like, what's your most precious possession? I'm thinking wedding, photos, something like that. Jane's first reaction, Shambles. I said, man, you'd run it back into a burning house, walk straight past the wedding photos, beyond everything else, straight to Shambles, and then bring him out safe and sound. Well, you know, given he's been around since Jane was six, which obviously wasn't very long ago, he's still looking pretty good. When I travel, I'm very fortunate with work, I get to travel a bit, and um, so, you know, I come back in and shambles in the bit of the bed that I usually sleep in. With his paw. Just over. And Jane thinks he's beautiful and wonderful and has protected him for many years. I think he's a bit of an eyesore, but there you go. Um, you know, it's okay, because beauty's in the eye of the older, am I right? Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, get a new one. Anyway, anyway. so there's history in shambles. But the thing that, um, it, it, it reminds me of uh, an, a story, a situation, something that Jesus did, that I hope will be helpful for us. Let's have a look at John chapter 9. Because I, I think there's something about the way God sees things. There's something about the way God sees us that is very easy to miss. But if we miss it, we miss out on an incredibly wonderful thing. And that's what I want to talk about today. And I want to talk about how we might respond to that. I'm going to show a couple of videos and things and hopefully it will be helpful. Let's pick it up in John chapter one. Uh, 9 verse 1. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is to his day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging us, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he insist, himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought, they brought to the Pharisees the man who'd been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how, how he had received this sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you, said, what have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he that now he can see? 
We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For although already the Jews had decided that among that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue, that is why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. What a story. What a situation. Can you imagine it? They're going down the road. Jesus, this incredible man, with his disciples, the guys who have left my nets. I'm ready to follow. I am yours. Lead me. And they see this man who's been blind from birth. He's a struggling guy. He's a beggar. He sits in the road. He's one of those people... Um, that sometimes we try not to see. Have you ever found yourself trying not to catch the eyes of one of those dirty people that are a little dangerous, that you don't know how they're going to react if you start a conversation? I was in Scotland recently, and um, it was raining, of course, and um, it was really raining. It was Scottish rain. <laughs> I got out of the taxi after a reasonably long uh, trip, and so you know, I got out of the taxi, I ran across the road trying to dodge the rain, I saw this guy, looks very similar, it's not that guy, but he looked like that guy, huddled around, he was sitting on cardboard to protect him from basically a lot of hills in Scotland, so a lot of water running down underneath him, and he's on this cardboard, and he's surrounded by blanket upon blanket upon blanket upon blanket, and he's huddling there, and he's sitting right by the cash point. So, of course, everyone's going up the cash point and desperately hoping, don't mug me, don't mug me, don't steal this, don't steal it. And then people are hiding stuff, people are doing all sorts of stuff that they have no evidence for. But they're trying desperately to deal with this situation somehow. It's a difficult one to deal with, perhaps. We've got cash out of the wall and stuff, and people were feeling anxious. You could see kind of people shuffling around. What I did notice, which was really beautiful, was there were lots of coffee cups around the guy. Uh, because people had obviously just been taking their money out of the wall and buying him stuff, which I guess is why he was near a cash point, to be able to make sure people could do that. So I went up to him and I said, hey, um, do you want an umbrella? I checked the shop next to them, and they sold umbrellas. I thought, this is, he doesn't need more caffeine, but he does need an umbrella, right? He's sitting there, literally, shh, shh. I said, man, do you want an umbrella? He said, uh, oh, no, no, no. And then he pointed at what looked like, like a fuzzy thing, but it's actually a dog. He says, the dog doesn't like it. I said, really? <laughs> you nut? Really? I said, train the dog. I did. I said, train the dog to get used to it. It'll be better. He's like, no, no. I said, I'll get you some food. Said, okay, fine. So we've got some drink, actually, some caffeine. But the interesting thing is, this was the kind of guy... One of those people who sit in the same place asking for the money again and again and again. Blind since birth, so he's been doing it for a while. And the disciples walk along, and you know how they see him? They see him as a theological discussion point. Hmm, all this suffering in the world. Hmm, Jesus, tell us. Who sit? It's a discussion point. It's a point to observe and have a discussion around with a spiritual person. Jesus doesn't approach it that way. His parents, the reason I read such a long passage, because I wanted to bring in his parents. I wonder how his parents saw him. You know, I don't want to judge anyone, because I think if I was in a situation, kind of like the pictures Harry showed, with somebody who couldn't earn money in the family, that's a massive pressure. That's a massive pressure in those times, with no kind of medical care, no kind of help. But the parents definitely seem to put their social position and connections above their son. So you wonder how that would have worked over the time for this guy's life. Of course, the Pharisees, the religious people, how did they see him? As somebody to look after and care for and show the love of God? Absolutely not. The Pharisees saw, again, a theological discussion, a point of principle, a threat, perhaps, to their own religion. But what did Jesus see? Jesus saw something totally different. Jesus saw opportunity. Jesus saw an opportunity that said, look, do you know what? This has happened 
all these years so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Don't you get it? All of this for God to do something incredible. And it's going to happen now. Are you ready? So he spat on the floor. <laughs> not the next action I would have expected. But he did, he rubs the guy's eyes, says, it's not even done right now, go wash it. Because I'm going to send you, go to the pool. I'm sent to you. Go there, wash it off and come on back. See, I think many of us look at the problems and challenges in our lives. I know I do this. And I don't, my first reaction, quite frankly, is not, awesome, God can do miracles. Brilliant! I have a nightmare schedule this week. I've got to go to this meeting, I've got to go to that meeting, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I'm behind on that, I've missed that deadline. Financially, I'm not on top of my numbers. Guess what? God's great! <laughs> That's not me. I do all of the bit up until, guess what? God's great. <laughs> yeah? I do all of that, except for God's great. Because my natural reaction is to be one of the other characters in the story. And of course, when I'm feeling really self-pitiful, I will say I'm the blind guy. Oh, my life's so tough. Nobody sees me. Nobody thinks of me. Oh, when's the miracle coming? Another coffee, please. My life is not tough. Even when I'm sort of whack that I think it is. You ever heard the phrase, first world problems? Someone described it to me once and said, oh yeah, Chris, that really is a problem that my diamond ring is too tight. <laughs> you know, it's like, really? How many first world problems are we so confused by and consumed by yeah, that we don't react? Great! It's an opportunity for God to do great things. In fact, there's a sense in this in which there's actually a plan almost it's almost like this has happened so that. There's like an equation. These things happen so that. I've got a problem in my family because of this or that. So that. I have a challenge in my work. So that. I have a problem where I live. The thing doesn't work. I so that. God has a plan. And is working in our lives, I believe, step by step, day by day. Jesus saw something different. And I think Jesus sees something different in you and in me. If only we'd take the time to look at it. But here's the interesting thing that it struck me as well is where Jesus sees it. You see? Because, see, Jesus sees all these things, pain, suffering, challenging, issues, opportunities, job promotions, careers, studies, whatever it is, relationships. He sees all of these, says, wow, this has happened so that. But where does he see it? It's in verse 1. He says, as he went along. See, many of us are too busy to see God working in our lives because we think it happens in a set part of our calendar. I am going to work now, and I will be a disciple there. I am leaving my home, and at home I am a disciple. In between, I'm trying to get the rest seat. I'm trying to beat the guys to the car, parking space. I'm trying to make sure that that guy doesn't cut me up as he walks down the street. I'm late to get out of my way. See, I don't think Jesus was Jesus at set pieces. He was Jesus like the middle bit as well on the way. And I think for myself, it's so easy for me to think that my Christianity and my Jesus type stuff happens in meetings and appointments. Because I think we could see a lot more miracles happen in all of our lives if we actually thought about this along the way. And um, now I'm going to share a video with you right now to sort of emphasize this point. It's a very difficult move video to share. It's not about me, it's about somebody that you'll see in a minute. It, it, it's incredibly, I think, powerful. You can look away if you feel like it's not helpful for you. Okay? I only want to share this video because I find it uh, incredibly moving. And I think on this point about living our lives to our calendars and our diaries and not really looking for God, I, I 
just wonder if this will help, and I hope it will. It's based on, it, it's a video that is on a website called Blue Sky Thinking. It's a video that Harry, Harry's in the Charities Commission, Committee at his school, and uh, he did a presentation to the third years recently on hope, which was great, and they all loved that. And he also did a presentation on Blue Sky Thinking, and he shared this video with me that he shared with the school children. And um, the, 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 the adult man in the video is one of the teachers at the school, in fact. So, you know, if you're interested in it, I'll, I'll put it up on my Facebook page and I'll tell you Blue Sky Thinking is the, 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 the website. But it, it was done by the parents, and at the end, it's the boy, it's a message from the boy. The boy is called Sky. Okay? So, um... Imagine being mum and dad making that, because it's for a charity for um, for brain tumours and brain cancer, and it's the number one cancer killer for children. And uh, you know, you think about it, right? You think about. I was thinking about. It. I was thinking about when when David Bowie died recently, and other things. I was thinking about the guy's amazing, really talented. Made the most of what he got in a worldly way. But did he make the most of what he got in God's way? I think of Sky, I think of myself and my choices in my life. And I, and I ask you to think about you and your choices in your life. You are so gifted. You are so blessed. You are so I really think that as he went along the way, that's what Jesus did. And that's why Jesh could share such a powerful communion about only Jesus and why Jesus. And so as you think about um, yourself today, I want to share one quick thing. Because I want to share about how do we respond? How do we actually respond today and tomorrow as a result of that? How do we make the, the most of everything that we've got um, it's not about being strong. If you've got weaknesses, that's good, because it's an opportunity for God. If you've got limitations, that's good, because it's an opportunity for God. If you have tests, that's good, because it's an opportunity for God. But you know what? You've got to also allow Him to work in your life, don't you? And so the second point I want to just share, and then we're going to finish off, is called, uh, Have You Been Thrown Out Yet? Let's read on about the story of the blind man. Verse 24, it said, A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, 
What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from. Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a blind, a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard this, that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Isn't it an incredible thing that when we really get that this is not a problem, an obstacle, a challenge. This is a moment for God to do something incredible. Not according to our schedules, but according to God's timetable. Then guess what happens? Stuff gets in the way. Something challenging, something difficult, something problematic potentially but you know what? The man had to go with it. He was called back. He thought, oh, thank goodness I've had enough of those Pharisees. My parents have denied me. No one else is interested in me. At least I've still got away. You know, they haven't thrown me out. Round two. <laughs> Round two. Hey, you know, blind guy. He was blind, but not any blind anymore. Come back. We haven't finished with you yet. So you can imagine, right? You're walking in going, right, what is it? And I love the spirit of the guy. He, can't, he isn't... If he was writing like a script for let's all learn how to debate with people of other views, this wouldn't be it. He didn't go there as a master of lecturing because he's sarcastic. He's irritating. He's a bit smug at times. He's certainly very confident and not in any way respectful to these guys. But I like it. Yeah. I like it. I like that sense of, I don't actually know what I'm going to say. I'm not even sure I know what I'm going to say or how I'm going to say it. But he was a guy. Okay, fine. Thank you for that. A bit more. He was a prophet. Okay, fine. Thanks for that. He healed me. Okay, fine. For that. Who is this son of God? It's me. Okay, I'm worshipping. He goes on this massive journey of learning because he's ready to get into conflict. If he just said, do you know what, guys, you're right. I'll just take the blood. I'll just take the healing. <laughs> I'd be tempted, follow his parents. Yeah, I'll just take the healing. Does Jesus go, I don't know. It just happened. I can stay in my community. I can get respect. I'll probably get looked after by the religious, religious guys. And guess what? I still got my sight. <laughs> he didn't do that. He was ready to get into conflict. He spoke up. He didn't care who he had been. Because it wasn't about him. He learned through conflict. And do you know what happened to him as a result? He was comforted by Jesus. Isn't that great? Yeah. Sometimes we, um, we get through a conflict and we're in a situation for God. And we, we're starting to maybe start to come to church. So we get really committed to church. And guess what happens? Things get in the way. And there's problems. And, there's, and it's like, God, I'm just trying to do what's right for goodness sake. Well, you just not got down to verse 20, 35 yet. That's all. That comfort is coming. That encouragement is coming because Jesus never leaves you hanging out to dry. But you just haven't got to verse 35. You've got more conversations that you need to have. You've got more discussions you need to have. You've got something else you've got to do to learn to grow to be ready for verse 35. Which is where Jesus comes to him and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he takes him through to a point of clarity. But you know what I love is Jesus heard he'd been thrown out and he found him. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, wasn't that what we all wanted? To be found by God. But to be found by God, um, it, we need to be prepared to go through the conversations. We need to be prepared to sacrifice. We need to be prepared to respond. You know, I was talking to somebody recently um, who has the gift of service. 
Anyone here? Well, you probably would say it by yourself. But does anyone know anyone who has the gift of service? Like, you go to their house and you just think, man, I'm loved. Uh, and you know, they're hospitable. They just go the extra mile. They're always serving. Anyone know anyone like that? Children, if you're next to your mothers, say yes. You know, but anyway, you know, yeah, absolutely. Many of us do, right? I know someone like that. This person happens to be a lady, and she is extraordinary at this. But you know what? The, the reality is, that means she gets really hurt. Because when you express the gifts God's given you, it generally leads to hurt. Because that's what happened to Jesus. And this man was given this gift of sight, and he had to go and express it, he had to stand up for it, and do you know what? It led to hurt. If you take the cross and the crown together, and so, I want to ask you, have you been thrown out yet? <laughs> have you stood up for Jesus to the point, not because you're being sarcastic, because that's not a good role model, but, you know, have you stood up for Jesus to the point where someone said, wow, you're different. There's something about you. There's something I want from you. There's something I need from you. I kind of got about 50% there on Friday morning. I was in an airport lounge in Miami on my way back. It was Friday afternoon, and I, I, I was good. I snuck out my quiet time book. Thank you, Miko, by the way. It's one of yours. Love beyond reason. It's fantastic. So I snuck it out, and I'm hiding it kind of from all the guys because I'm traveling with a lot of work colleagues from the client. And I go, uh, what you reading? <laughs> it's a book. <laughs> What's the book? Love beyond reason. <laughs> What's that? Love beyond reason. I'm in now, come on. See, I have a weakness in my character. I'm not very loving. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I really want to grow in lovingness this year. So I'm really reading this book and other stuff, and I'm praying fast about this. And I really, you know, because I can do the right thing, but it's not really from a heart. Th and the guy's like, okay, got a nut. <laughs> in the middle of this airport. And then he says, but you know what, Chris, I'm kind of into theology. I said, really, man, are you? In what way? And so he starts telling me about his com uh, confirmation. He starts telling me about his beliefs. And we get in this really great conversation. But I was definitely afraid I was going to get thrown out. <laughs> I wish I'd been braver, though, in the first instance. Do you know what I mean? But I kind of got there. What are we going to do, guys? I want to show you one more video, and then we're done. Okay, so happy days. One more video. And this is about a dancing guy. Has anyone seen the dancing guy video? We share this at work sometimes. It's really funny. I think so anyway. And it's about starting movements. If you want to change something, you need people to change stuff. Is that fair? So in culture change stuff, we share this video as a discussion point. Um, I, I wonder how much it relates to this guy. Let's see. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, it actually let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them. Plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's the first is now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out. They won't be ridiculed. And they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. But over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If 
mission is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. I kind of thought it was fun. But you know, the thing is, that's a real event. It was fil filmed on a camera, it wasn't staged in any way. That actually happened in wow. terms of getting momentum. You know what, guys, what we're asked to do is nothing more than follow Jesus. We're not asked to be on our own, we're not asked to be solo players, we're asked to be followers. Followers of Jesus. And I believe when we do that, first thing we will do, we will see something different from what everyone else sees. We will see opportunities that said, and this happened so that... In every situation, God can do some great things. And finally, we'll get thrown out of a few places. But that's okay. Because there was always some people sitting on the fence, sitting on the grass, who weren't going to dance no matter what happened. But I'll tell you what, it looked a lot more fun dancing. Thank you very much.